Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We'll let everybody go ahead and get into the meeting and then we'll get started. Great, looks like we've got 30 participants and climbing, so that's great. So good afternoon and welcome to Maryland Department of Labor's 7th Virtual Training Institute. I'm launching a poll just to find out the various roles of our attendees. So if you would take a moment to tell us what role you play in your program, that would be great. Feel free if you're having technical issues to send a message to me uh, in the chat. If not, please address your comments uh, in the Q&A or in the chat to everyone. We are using the webinar format of Zoom today, so participants are automatically muted and only the camera of the host can be seen. I would ask you as soon as the webinar ends to fill out the session evaluation form that should pop up on your screen. So we would appreciate it if you would uh, complete that evaluation for every session that you attend. All right, great. I've shared the results of the survey. Looks like the largest number of participants in our session today are instructors, um, followed by instructional specialists, some transition specialists, a few program administrators. So that's great. Welcome, we're so glad that you are all here. Today, we are going to hear from Lara Ostrowski, and she is presenting Making Technological Footprints, an overview and application of the Digital Literacy Framework Learning Modules. Lara, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Betsy. Thank you. Um, good to see everyone. Happy Valentine's Day and happy birthday to Frederick Douglass. So, Welcome, it's really good to see everyone here. Um, as Betsy mentioned, I am here to speak about the freshly released Digital Literacy Framework Learning Modules, the companion courses to Maryland Department of Labor's Digital Literacy Framework for adult learners. Um, I plan to present on various aspects of the learning modules inclusion into our lesson and program planning I'm going to start off with some research-based study information about the merits of online training for, you know, such, you know, such as the digital literacy framework learning modules, um, a sampling of the videos within the modules, and some concrete applications, which I hope to brainstorm with everyone in attendance. So let's begin. As Betsy mentioned, I am an adult education program specialist with the Maryland Department of Labor's Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning. Um, my email address, should you want to reach out about uh, feedback or just have continued conversations post webinar, is first name, my first name, dot uh, my last name at maryland.gov. Oh, and I should warn everyone, as you can see, I'm using Prezi, which um, <laughs> I think it's making me a little motion sickness at times, but the reason for you know me incorporating this was just to try something new, something a little more dynamic. So maybe I'll just say that I'm switching because if you wanna close your eyes or look away or something, then you can look back, All right? I'm gonna switch. So our disclaimer is that the content or opinions expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect or present the views, positions, or policies of the Maryland Department of Labor, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply an official endorsement by the Maryland Department of Labor. I'm going to switch. All right. So again, the objectives that I have for today, um, as I hinted at, I hope to accomplish four things. One, to discern the need for online training that touches on an instructor's couple of important facets, emotional and social development within that online learning capacity, despite the virtual channels. Two, 
through a select examples of the learning modules in action. I want to assess the implications of the definitions in further reaching contexts. Three, I would like to recognize the skills, both technical and cognitive, necessary for digital inclusion within lesson plans. And four, sort of playing in this sandbox a little, devise some thoughts on learning activities for some sample tasks, considering both those technical and cognitive domains. I'm gonna move on. So the agenda, um, which I guess I pretty much outlined, but we're gonna look at the research. We are gonna look at examples from three of the elements, communicative, computational thinking, and investigative. And we're gonna focus on those technical and cognitive skill sets that make our learners so, including us, so perseverant and steadfast in the online medium. We are gonna craft out some activities using our various frameworks, specifically the digital literacy framework for adult learners. And please feel free to ask any questions throughout. Um, Gina, it is so good to see you here. I'm just gonna give you a shout out. Um, so yeah, please feel free to ask any questions throughout. Betsy, if you don't mind, just if I miss anything, please just interrupt. I wanna make sure that we get everything covered. I forgot to say, but I'm switching. All right, now into the training. So I'm gonna, um, and sort of the um, basis for the training and how we can kind of think about it moving forward. So um, I'm gonna switch. Okay. So there are definitely merits to online learning, um, but thinking about our approach to online learning, courses do provide some, some really important, um, I would say, positive aspects, including the sort of autonomy of training and the flexible learning environment for sure. Um, in particular, when individuals feel that the learning is consistent with their interests and needs, the learning satisfaction is greater. So um, attitude in a study by Sang and Chen, attitude has an orientational impact on the perception of activities and it will impact learning performance. So this is important for us to consider as well as our students. Learners can interact with their coursework in an online space at any time without any space limitation whatsoever. And it allows them to think and reflect upon some of the finer points at their own pace um, and any standard operating procedures that go along with it, whether it's a framework in our case, whether in the service industry model, perhaps it was a set of procedures on the job. So overall, I think we can, we can feel really great about online learning and our learning modules because that will help us professionally. I'm gonna switch. So along with these positive aspects, the social and emotional dimensions of adult learners in the online environment is important to consider. Um, besides being, besides teaching the way we were taught, we also teach the way we were learned, the way we learned, sorry, <laughs> the way we learn, that's according to Olson and Hora. If um, teachers foster creative and industrious online spaces in their classrooms, our learning experiences as teachers and the ways in which we learn online, that needs to be understood in, in pretty, pretty significant detail. So um, also we need to, to nurture and grow these understandings so that our students can experience the best, um, the best modes possible. So giving um, a possible extension of the learning activities into a collaborative space like online discussion boards or even a group study circle these impacts can all be maximized. Um, so what we do at home or individually within the digital literacy framework learning modules, we can then take that back for further study for extension activities to really just bolster the experience overall. All right, I'm moving ahead. So um, next I'm gonna talk about LP. Um, in this context, learner or learning, presence, learning presence. So considering learning presence, or as Shay et al. and Pawan indicate, uh, it is self and co-regulation in online spaces. So some of the framework phases that emerged in this 
in this study of learning presence are forethought, so that planning component, the coordination, task designation um, was one phase. Another phase was performance, monitoring, and strategy use, and reflection. All of these are phases within that learning presence in an online environment. The study, Taiwan study, was done with English language and literacy teachers um, with the uh, predominant outlook being that heavily focused and coded uh, areas were in the strategy use, the, the, perform the planning, excuse me, the planning stage. Uh, that was an indicator that was, that was strongly um, recorded in terms of seeking and offering information. So within that, within that performance, within that strategy and strategizing to um, receive maximum value for the, um, for the work performed, uh, learners were highly focused on um, going beyond the classroom materials to find information for a deeper understanding, which you know is is a superb indicator to examine, particularly if someone is passionate about a topic, you know, to what extent will it be carried on into the future? Um, monitoring um, was another category coded most frequently. Again, monitoring as a part of performance. Um, and that was pertaining to, uh, where the instructors expressed reactions to their own, as well as their uh, co-instructors, um, co classmates' input and performance. So again, that sort of interaction, there's the independent piece of discovery and exploration, as well as the coordinated effort of, of sort of going over outcomes with your team members. So the upshot here is that in looking for ways to move forward and enhance our professionalization for ourselves, that, that desire to seek out additional training and, and certifications and licenses, um, there, it coordinates nicely with the idea of professionalism, a long lifelong learning pursuit where individuals will engage and, and want to, and really seek to improve um, the, the, their engagement with the content, the, um, to serve those needs, to really take those, those trainings and certifications even the step further in that lifelong learning context. So, um, you know, I thought that was a very interesting study in terms of how we interact with our learning environment. I'll just pause here and see if there's any questions. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So lastly, um, how does this all kind of pertain to the learning uh, modules framework and the, um, or excuse me, the digital literacy framework um, for, with the learning modules in mind. Um, I think there's a couple of important points to really take this from our study to the next step, which is implementing it in the classroom, um, having that stake, having that stake in professional development and really being able to sort of embrace the framework in its, um, in its faithful form. Um, modeling our own experiences to create the, the maximum kind of exploratory activities and lesson plans and just overall program, programmatic plans, um, as well as this coupling of the vi video-based training that's present in the learning modules, plus observations and comparisons with peers to really identify what are the strengths posed by the framework, what are the growth opportunities that can be or incorporated within the classroom. So I'm gonna ask a question now, and maybe we can, we can kind of engage in the chat for a moment. Um, thinking about our own professional development pursuits, and I mean online, let's, let's focus in online professional development pursuits. What do you enjoy the most about the online format? Assuming you're undertaking an online professional development, such as VTI, what do you uh, enjoy most about the format? Hmm. Flexibility, lack of commute, can do it from home. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly flexible and easy to attend. Nice, I see collaborating. So the, the accessibility, accessibility, um, component and the engagement component. Yeah, Hannah, I agree. 
opportunities for synchronous and asynchronous um, and the ability to um, connect, connect when, with people from afar. So um, absolutely. And I think there's a lot to be said for how our learners can then also really begin to embrace given our own preferences and, and they already do, they already see it as such a, such a boon to um, juggling multiple tasks and priorities, um, but sort of digging deep into what sort of makes it exciting, what makes it interesting. Now, thinking about that participation component, because I saw in, in some of the answers, the, the opportunity to collaborate, you know, not just take in information, but collaborate, which is one mode of participation, but how do you strive to participate in, a, in an online uh, professional development? What does participation look like to you in online PD? What does online, uh, what does participation look like in online professional development? Communicating with the chat, being given a task. Okay, cool, cool. So some of that is um, instructor driven, some of it uh, individual. Breakout rooms asking questions, joining the conversation, using the chat, tools, sharing information with the chat. Yep, yep. And hearing others' feedback. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a lot of fun. Um, so some of it, yeah, going back to the, the statement and taking in relevant information. Awesome, Jovita. I'm seeing that kind of blend of like, what are what are we sort of prompted to do versus what we take upon ourselves? And I think that I think that model needs to somehow communicate itself to to those learners who may not already know in advance. You know, oh, this is something that that I really want to pay attention to, or this is something that I really want to jump into the conversation. You know, they're kind of led to that point. Um, you know, in, in terms of that practice, connecting with people you might not typically. Yeah, 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 definitely. So um, all of these things that we, you know, consider as gems and jewels within the online space, um, it's, it's always good to keep those in mind as we engage in any kind of online training pursuit, as well as continue to transfer these, um, these skills to our classrooms. I'm going to move ahead to my next uh, sort of conversation piece, which is the modules themselves. Um, just by show of Yes, no, in the chat. Um, who has had an opportunity to sign in and look at the digital literacy framework learning modules? And I'm going to go ahead and put, can I put this out to everyone? Betsy, Betsy, if I can't here, hold on, let me do this. Um, if you don't mind, Betsy, can you put this uh, link? Sure, absolutely. I don't think I'm, I'm putting it out to everyone. Um, so yes, yeah, some yeses, some no, just the one. Yeah, I mean, I know it was just last week. So, you know, it's not like hop to it or anything. I mean, it was just last week. Um, so that's cool. You know, it's good to see so many yeses, frankly. Um, but they are 100% free of charge for you to undertake. So whether it's one right now, because I know it's a pretty intense period in the uh, grant funded programs, as well as programs across the board, it's always kind of intense. Um, when you have a moment, you know, just looking at at one or two, uh, one for starters. Um, I may have, is it in a circle? Oh, um, I'm getting to it, Joanne. You may you may recognize some of the uh, some of the aspects. So let's see. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let me let me move. I'm going to jump into the modules circle so that we can see. Um, let me just see, Pamela. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Did you like computational? Let, hopefully, you know, it'll continue to provide some, some hours of, of entertainment and just engagement. Nice. All right. I'd love to have anyone who's like chomping at the bit for these. Like, I would love to have a conversation with you about them. Um, just getting your feedback. I know sometimes in our spaces, it's hard to, to connect that way, but whenever you have a moment, just shoot me an email. Cool. All right. Let me move on. I'm getting caught up in the chat. So the digital literacy framework is uh, accessible, um, not the framework itself, that's accessible, of course, online, but the learning modules piece is accessible through the link that we shared. You can, again, free of charge to you, create an account or sign in if you have one, providing that frame, 
providing that framework context from the digital literacy framework for adult learners into you know, increasing that understanding and improving outcomes for them personally and professionally um, throughout for all of our learners within the state, adult learners within the state of Maryland. So again, these ideas are in the context of considering both the operational process, technical skill set, and the cognitive. So approaching those two um, with sort of that overlay in mind. Okay, so jumping into the communicative element, let me go ahead and advance and then I'm going to show you a clip. So the communicative element, um, this module probes for those, you know, familiar with the communicative element, its definitions and guiding principles, it's going to probe deeper into the use of the element, particularly um, in terms of how we engage with, uh, with one another within our communities. Um, through that, through those various communication styles, written, oral, with the consideration in mind of our audience, our purpose, and our tone, just to name like a brief, a brief sampling. So the video in mind that I'm trying to um, share, let me move over there now, is all about audience purpose and tone. So let me go ahead and play so you can kind of see what it looks like within the within the learning um, module space here. Let me just point out a few navigational pieces. Um, we are actually inside the communicative element learning module. Um, there are some things that are consistent from course to course, like the welcome, the definition of digital literacy. Um, and then each module starts to get into its own elements, sort of meat and potatoes. So within the considerations for digital communication, we do think about audience purpose and tone. And this is just a snippet of what you'll see in the communicative element. Know your audience. Our roles change throughout the day. In other words, we wear many different hats. Therefore, we communicate in many ways within the digital environment. Explore the ways that communication can and should differ for different audiences. Communication with different audiences has different parameters and rules. You should have awareness of what these differences are and make sure they are reflected in your communication. Recognize the purpose. The purpose of communication is the crux of the matter. All digital citizens need an awareness of purpose before constructing communication. Even a brief reflection can help to clarify and guide our topic to a better conclusion. The same concept can be articulated in several ways. If the purpose is clear, the choice of tone should follow. Thinking about the areas of academia, personal life, and the workplace, and accepting the need to differentiate between them, expands our capacity to communicate effectively. When and if individuals recognize the importance of correct and appropriate communications, the process will become... No, no need to do that, sorry, I think I went I think I moved my cursor too soon. Um, that was essentially what I where I wanted to stop though. So let me just advance the bullet points. Sorry, didn't mean to prematurely end the video. Um, but thinking about some of the things that were discussed here in the video, um, and for you know those of you who worked on the on the actual work groups, hopefully you know it's you're seeing the content um that you worked so hard to create coming to life in this visual way um how might you incorporate the communicative element into a lesson say you already have a lesson created on professionalism in the workplace how might you incorporate this element of our digital literacy framework into that kind of a lesson Yeah, yeah, Jen, composing a professional email. Absolutely. That's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, a role play. Catherine, what would the role play kind of look like? Um, what would kind of be the subject matter and the plot, I guess? 
Yeah, I was definitely thinking in terms of business writing, business communication. That's a wonderful example. Um, and the reason I kind of phrased it that way as how would you incorporate the element into a lesson that's already, you know, something that you're already utilizing in the classroom is that it can be, it can be that schematic. You don't have to, you know, go into the modules thinking I'm going to have to, you know, create all kinds of different new content. Um, you know, we're kind of, you know, taking the framework as, a, as an avenue to, to really map over the existing content you have. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, give the subjects the typical situation with a challenging aspect. Yep, yep. So kind of those crucial um, and and compassionate conversations. Yeah, giving students the opportunity to share an idea of how they would want to learn specific, learn a specific concept. Yeah, yeah. Um, look at different forms of business communication that exist online and analyze the purpose. Yeah, I mean. A lot of different great ways to, to begin to think about this. Cool. Um, all right, thanks. Now, the next module I wanted to take a look at, let me switch over here to Prezi, um, is the, what did I say, computational thinking. So let me, let me go ahead there in advance. Okay. So computational thinking, speaking about those critical thinking and problem solving skills and abilities, um, you know, mapped out into four subtopics within the digital literacy framework learning module, uh, abstraction, algorithm, decomposition and pattern recognition. So these ideas, what appeals to me the most about this particular elements learning module is the fact that a lot of the ideas are not presented in a mathematical context. So, you know, maybe you're looking at an example of sort of pattern recognition in music um, or decomposition in, in navigation or project management, that kind of thing. So I think it's wonderful that, um, you know, we can think about this, this particular element outside of the field of math. So let me go over there now, let me, let me navigate and I can show you a little bit more about the learning um, modules, the dashboard. Um, so all of the courses are pretty easy to access. I'm going to jump into computational thinking. And the term digital literacy skill. So, you know, it'll prompt you to jump right in if you've left off from somewhere. But let me go into the parts of computational thinking so I can take a look at decomposition. And I'll share with you the video content that we have for. Decomposition takes a large task and breaks it down into smaller sections. For many people, a large task, such as doing a deep clean of an office, can be very overwhelming. Breaking it down into smaller tasks makes the task more manageable and easier to move through. You'll advance through the content automatically. Um, so that was just one of the four sort of implications and applications of computational thinking. Um, what might be, so let me give you another sort of lesson topic, I suppose. How might you incorporate this, these computational thinking elements into a lesson on preparing for the extended response prompt for the GED test? How might you apply the the skills, the, the abilities discussed in the decomposition lesson, how might you apply those to preparing for the extended response prompt in RLA for the GED test? Hmm. Yeah, I envy your organizational skills and abilities. Um, make an outline to break down the prompt. Yep, definitely. And then of course, you know, Many, many extensions, as we know, spawn from, from that activity alone. Um, yep. Sections. Yeah. Wonderful. Breaking it into sections. Fantastic. Um, and so just to pause and kind of, you know, debrief for a quick moment, are you seeing ways just, just in kind of looking at the learning modules and what you've seen thus far, 
seeing ways that um, this can kind of probe, you know, further, um, further thought on applications for, you know, how can, how might we incorporate, you know, in addition to the content itself, the, the cognitive aspect, you know, what other tools exist for, um, for that digital component? Um, we're going to get to those in a moment. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, the last, let me go back to Prezi. The last um, element that I'd wanted to share out is investigative. So let me move to investigative. Um, so now we're speaking about ways to, you know, locate information that's trustworthy and authentic and really finding the ways to be safe and, you know, finding the credi credible information in this vast world of the internet. Um, so increasing awareness too of some of the, the dangerous scams and, and red flags that exist. So um, within this element, um, I did wanna share with you one, um, one video snippet that talks about uh, phishing scams. So um, let me move there. Again, going back to my navigating back to my dashboard, I can kind of you know jump pretty pretty seamlessly from one module to the next just to kind of reflect show you how to make your way around this on reflect on you know things that I might have seen and let me go back and kind of toy with that idea. So I think it is under the process it's under the element itself. Oh no, it's probably under validating content and information. That makes sense. So here is uh, here is a video, less than a minute. So again, like very bite sized, very um, in and out kind of accessible um, content here. So let me go ahead and share this video, and then we'll pause again. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. What does this mean in reference to job searching? When seeking employment, you may have come across ads that stress the urgency to apply now or offer large sums of money for people with minimal to no skills. Oftentimes, these links to apply are ways to access your personally identifying information with no intent to offer a position. From false job listings to email phishing scams, it is important that you increase your awareness of safe digital activities. Email phishing scams often occur at your place of employment and through your personal email. Either way, it is critical that you do not provide a username, password, or any personally identifying information through email or click on any provided link. It is particularly tough when the email is sent to your personal email rather than a work-related email. In a personal email phishing scam, it may appear to come from one of your personal accounts so it can get complicated in order to detect the authenticity of the email. Rule of thumb, never provide personally identifying information. You can always reach out with a phone call or email request with whom you have the account, for example, your bank or PayPal. So good to hear. Uh, I know Jen is in the, Gina, I'm sorry. I know you're in the audience. So um, good to hear your voice uh, through this. Um, so yeah, I mean, just wanted to share out some of the, again, anyone in the work group, sort of the fruits of those labors, but also the, the honest benefit of how we can begin to think about some additional applications of the digital literacy framework that, that, you know, we may not have already sort of seen and observed within the framework itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, Gina, <laughs> um, it is you, I promise. Um, so Thinking about the um, investigative element, um, and it's kind of a broad one, how might you incorporate the investigative element into a lesson plan on wise consumerism? Um, are there things that, you know, aside from the phishing um, sort of warnings that you could, I don't know, think to um, employ with your students? So how might this apply to a lesson plan on wise consumerism? Joanne, I see you have your hand up. Would you mind to just drop your comment in the chat? Thank you.
Yeah, so right for a lot of um, applications and purposes, when we think about some of the some of the some of the smaller that that all of a sudden can magnify and become larger um, consequences of you know just a, a wrong click here or thinking you're entering your information in a safe spot, um, you know a lot of lot of different ways that we can raise that awareness piece through. Um, just kind of uh, looking through, going through our investigative element in the learning modules and just having those prompts, having those um, considerations for uh, additional content. So just to, let me move back to the Prezi, just a quick yes or no again, checkpoint. Um, when you are crafting out for the instructors in the audience, let's see here. Oh, Cynthia, let me just read here. Um, we discussed not giving your personal information out to anyone who contacts you. I had a student years ago who gave his bank information out and lost all of his money. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so again, just things that we we may not, I mean, I guess in terms of, you know, now I'm thinking in terms of like banking in general or those sort of consumer math topics, you know, we may think budgeting, you know, that's a really important aspect and needs versus wants and values and things, but, you know, being prompted to think about some of the other applications that we may not consider right off the bat. Um, things like wise consumerism with respect to phishing scams or protecting your password or um, fake job ads and things of that nature. Um, Joanne, something that would be helpful would be to give a demonstration of an email showing learners what to look for. Like teacher, oh, hover over the mouse sender's email. So I'm glad you brought that up and you, I promise, you know, are not a plant in this presentation. So let me go back because that is, um, there is an example, Gina, we're going to get to hear from you again. So here's an example. Uh-oh, it looks like Amrith is a bit stressed. Let's stop in and see what's going on. Amrith is reading through his email. Maybe he got bad news from his boss. Here's the email he's reading. Fortunately, Amrith is one smart cookie. Initially, an email coming from the CEO speaking about guidelines and policy along with disciplinary actions caused Amrith a little anxiety, but something just didn't feel right. So Amrith reread the email. Once Amrith reread the email and recognized that there were several spelling and grammar errors, he knew something was wrong. The email also requested that he provide his personal employee username and password. Being aware of phishing, they wouldn't get him this time. He remembered the conversation with his IT department and knew that providing his username and password would never be requested via an email. It was a scam. Fortunately, Amrith took the time to review it and paid attention to the details. He didn't allow his initial emotions to cause him to act without thinking. Remember that before clicking links or providing your personally identifying information review the details. It doesn't always turn out so well for everyone if they take the bait. There's another type of scam I'd like to discuss and it has to do with information sharing or more specifically, false news. Before you proceed, check to see if you gain new insights regarding scams. So yeah, a prime example of how we can, you know, sort of see different, different aspects and angles to um, you know, some of the concepts that we're already covering in, you know, in substantial depth. Um, just a point about the learning modules, the, the quiz that was referenced or the, the learning check that was mentioned in the video is a quiz, as you see here on the left. Um, it's identified as a quiz, just some brief, you know, knowledge kind of verification. All right. So Going back to my sort of yes or no, and if you want to expound on it, please feel free to do so. Question, um, in your current lesson plans, are you finding that um, you'll have like maybe a field or a component that addresses the digital literacy framework for uh, adult learners? Are you, are you including that as a, as a sort of specific piece with respect to um, to, to respect to your lesson planning, particularly, of course, if you're, if you're teaching in any kind of a hybrid or an online space. I'm just curious about how you're approaching that with your, with your lesson planning. Okay. 
Okay, cool. That's great. Hannah, that's good to know. Um, because even if you're, and Cynthia, fantastic. Appreciate the honesty, Catherine. Yeah, okay. When I was in the classroom, Betsy says, and had to submit lesson plans, we were required to include elements of the digital literacy framework. Great, okay. Um, and so with some of these ongoing discussions, you know, we can see how something um, like the framework, how, how the modules themselves can begin to prompt that ongoing um, application. So, you know, more to come. It's ever evolving. I'm going to move ahead here um, and talk a little bit about the skills that we can be sort of focused on within these snippets, um, because each module provides you know, so much rich content in terms of how we can begin to incorporate it into our existing lessons. You know, these can be these can be short snippets of transference. Um, in fact, it can be something that you do in an online class, but it could also be something that you're doing in a face to face class. So let me move ahead here and look at the skills that we're speaking about. Um, so in terms of that lesson planning, you know, piece that 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 sort of practical application. Um, taking the technical, taking the, the cognitive and sort of like intersecting it, um, juxtaposing it with one another. Um, the digital literacy framework is that, that overlay uh, of sorts to sort of begin to amass the prerequisites, the, the technological prerequisites, the skills and the standards information. So taking a closer look, we can, we can see that perhaps in an activity like and we talked about this a moment ago, sending an email to your boss uh, to propose an idea or process improvement, um, something that's phrased in a professional way. So considering audience tone and purpose, um, you know, how can we think about the tech, how that technical piece might look? Well, maybe you'll, you know, incorporate something like Outlook or Gmail or whatever, you know, system that your, um, your program is using for the students to begin to start to think about that aspect. Um, if you're if you're deconstructing the RLA prompt, um, maybe you're doing some kind of a collaborative effort through Google Sheets, or maybe you're, you know, looking at different um, different. Uh, I know they have like art, whatever it's called, clip art, I guess, for um, those different process flows. You know, maybe you're using something like that with Excel. Um, something about phishing scams. If you're creating a flyer or an advertisement, um, you know, you might use pub Word or Publisher or whatever. Um, Google Docs, if you know, again, with that collaborative piece, um, and also Word, you know, if you're using kind of a SharePoint space. Um, Flip is a program that, uh, or an application rather, that I recently explored myself at a Texas TESOL conference. Um, there was a session about, um, you know, incorporating Flip, Flipgrid, I think it used to be called, and now it's Flip, um, into the classroom. And there's tons of considerations, of course. Um, you know, sometimes <laughs> with the digital digital, digital integration piece, um, it, you know, it's not so much the product. I mean, it is for sure. That's the goal. But the journey is often the the whole learning experience. Um, you know, particularly if you are kind of starting from the ground up on some of these applications. You know, kind of getting familiar with them and seeing where where the students sort of pain points are with the various applications and how how they can be adapted. Um, there definitely is no, you know, sort of chasing that golden unicorn when it comes to the perfect application. Um, we don't need to throw everything in at once. These are just some suggestions. Um, and if there's old standbys, that's that's great. You know, if you want to try something new, that's also great. Um, okay, Jen, let me just read out what you uh, put in the chat. Just wanted to add that the task listed will also hit multiple elements. Absolutely. They will frequently overlap naturally. Yep. Absolutely, that's so true. Um, and thank you for thank you for stating that. All right, let me move ahead to the of course what we're using in terms of our our standards, um, CCRS, ELPS, our digital literacy framework, all of the instructional frameworks um, available through the Maryland Department of Labor and within your um, within your agencies and programs. So those guiding principles and tools that are going to just, again, the digital literacy framework is just going to add that additional layer of, of inquiry and exploration. So here's an excerpt that um, I believe I 
created, I think. Um, yeah, I, I have to give credit to the next one that we're going to see. But for this one, um, you know, construct a public service announcement. I'm sure this is not an original thought of mine, but this is something that, you know, I just kind of pulled together. Construct a public service announcement informing communities about the dangers and warning signs of phishing scams. So as Jen mentioned, um, what, what are we looking at here? Maybe the technical, maybe the civic, communicative, investigative, investigative and productive elements could probably throw in collaborative, depending on if you're working uh, in pairs or teams on this particular kind of um, activity. Um, you know, with those standards included, um, I'm using CCRS, um, reading seven and writing eight, um, and identifying too that there might be uh, there might be some kind of computer skill if you're using uh, the application Flip. You know, let's let's get some familiarity. Maybe there's a whole like precursor to kind of just playing around with it and that kind of thing. Um, but having that identified element, um, knowing ahead of time that okay, this could be a potential pain point. All right, we're going to move ahead. So that leaves us with the activities themselves, um, thinking about the frameworks, thinking about what needs to be included. Let's take the last, I guess it's 14 minutes now, um, to think about ways that we can start to, to map out some of the activities. Um, so I want to kind of do this together and see what ideas we have um, as a team. So this is taken from um, actually Ashley Winkle, who I've worked with. Um, on some, some various links projects and things. She's very, very thoughtful and creative. Um, she does have, uh, the, the bottom there indicates the TCAL where she works, um, video project citation and, and you know, all that good stuff reference wise. Um, so this is all taken from her wakelet as a matter of fact. Um, so drawing conclusions in a reading passage, introduction to OSHA in the workplace. That would be kind of the title of this whole endeavor. And I think it spanned multiple, multiple classes, a few hours. Um, but by the end of the lesson, students will be able to draw conclusions about the importance of workplace safety and you know, being able to pull information out of, an, uh, out of a flyer or out of a written summary to, to properly synthesize and, and begin to um, implement those procedures. So the first thing I want to do is think about, you know, this is a pretty large undertaking, right? So, so what are some of the what are some of the steps that you foresee, um, you know, before we go into sort of looking at the nuts and bolts? Like if you're talking about workplace safety, if you're talking about an OSHA documentation or or some kind of an advertisement of sorts, like a public service announcement, what are some of the like road like you know, sort of hurdles or humps that you might find in that road to really communicating that information to, to the students in your class? What have been some of the hurdles that you might encounter? Um, I'm just curious, like if you're dealing with these heavy, like informational text-based documents and publications and things, what have been some of the hurdles to have them um, have the students and the learners really kind of parse through and begin to draw conclusions or sim synthesize information. I'm just curious. I wish I had an example. I should have put up an example. Um, yeah, fear of digging into this type of task, the language, that's exactly, that's exactly, you know, what I was thinking, Joanne. Um, passive voice, yeah, but also these, sometimes not, you know, over the top, like crazy terms, but sometimes pretty, pretty technical language. Um, yeah, definitely. I chose as kind of a precursor, something that wasn't an over the top technical word, but I'll show you in just a minute. Let me just look at a couple more chats. Um, Betsy, yeah, developing oral fluency, discussing safety, perfect, you know, relationships to OSHA versus in their country. Okay, background knowledge. This is all really good. Great points. Let me see here. Moving past barriers that create misunderstanding. Language learners often have a hard time grasping information that isn't simple fact, date, number, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, where I started from was not a place of like, you know, um, 
you know, some highly technical like OSHA ish word, um, clear and concise language. Great is, is with define teamwork. You know, let's, let's, if we're talking about work, if we're talking about the business, how can we define teamwork? You know, and what might we do? Like if we're trying to just bounce around some ideas about a term that, you know, maybe we do have some familiarity with, maybe it's not something that we have to resort to a dictionary or some technical publication to figure out what it means. You know, I put up a word cloud here, but what else, like what else could we do? Like when we're thinking about particularly digital skills, how might we elicit this information from our learners? How might we ask them to define teamwork? Let's see, Padlet, oh yay, I love Padlet. Combining strengths, okay. Jamboard, Jamboard, that's another, I think, pretty accessible tool. Act out examples. Oh, Catherine, have you, you mentioned role play before. Have you done it much? I would love, I would love to see your class doing that. I mean, I just love the engagement piece, the collaborative effort um, and hear about some of the, the maybe the, the hardships of performing that kind of an activity outweighed by, um, the pluses and the joy, I think, of, of kind of just having that environment and learning. Yeah, no, these are all great ideas. These are all really good ideas, particularly if you're trying to get away from, you know, um, you know, chat message, that kind of thing, even though I'm, I'm asking you to put it in the chat, but let's not worry about that. All right, brainstorm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great, lovely. And then let me um, move ahead to one of the more, I would say, you know, topical kind of lesson pieces that we have. So that, that previous was kind of a precursor. Um, this is actually the excerpt from, you know, and it's included in, in the Wakelet, uh, Ashley's Wakelet. Um, employers must provide employees a workplace free from recognized hazards. Here we go with the more, I would say just technical. It is illegal to retaliate against an employee for using any of their rights under the law, including raising a health and safety concern with you or with OSHA or reporting a work-related injury or illness. So that's kind of dense, you know, and that was like one of like seven, um, you know, employer responsibilities. So thinking again about like making, going back to the, you know, the accessibility piece and how we can incorporate technology to make this uh, kind of a, of a task more, palatable, more engaging, more fun. Um, if you were just looking at that alone, that blurb, um, what are some of the ways you might decompose it? Would you, would you, you know, look at specific language and try to break that down? I just threw out what might retaliate look like. Um, yeah, I mean, break that statement down into more than one sentence, definitely, definitely, um, that, that uh, second statement, yep, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, what's a recognized hazard? You know, what are we talking about? I think, you know, this isn't meant to be like a legal document. Well, actually it is. I'm sorry to say that it is. Um, so really understanding what that means, you know, really understanding what that means. Um, paraphrasing. Yep. 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 Um, because these are, uh, as I almost said, but these are, you know, uh, regulations and, and they are also meant to protect, you know, uh, their employer responsibilities and employee rights. So, you know, we are, we are kind of, um, yeah, providing an example. Perfect. That's exactly right. Um, of recognized hazard, because we are, you know, providing that guidance through something like this, this kind of an activity, you know, prompting, um, just again, that that knowledge that this is something that is an employee right, you know, in the workplace. Um, so last, and then I will pause for any questions. The last kind of activity I wanted to show, um, and this is kind of text heavy, but and so I apologize for that. But um, this outlines a scenario. I mean, we talked about scenarios. I think um, Catherine, you may have mentioned, you know, going through scenarios and. Um, you know, different situational examples in role play. Um, an employee must report to work by eight. The employee drove to the company parking lot at 7.30, parked the car, employee exited the car. So there's a whole host of situational kind of 
details included in this scenario. Essentially, you know, it talks about the parking lot and sidewalks privately owned by the facility. Employee stepped on the sidewalk, snip, slipped on the snow and ice, and the employee suffered a back injury. I'm paraphrasing some of what's in there, but um, here we go into what conclusions can be drawn about a response from OSHA. Um, how can we begin to think about this as a, a situation that has recognizable legal and employer-related responsibility requirements? Um, and this is not meant to come down on employers at all. It's meant to sort of have that open conversation between what is um, what is documented and what's required and what's sort of expected. So anyway, um, in drawing conclusions through this, I think there's a lot of information here. So how would you begin, those who are organizers in the group, how would you begin to kind of pull together the relevant information? How would you solicit the, the details that can help an individual to draw these conclusions about a response from OSHA? Because again, it's just so text heavy. How do we start to pull that apart? Using what kinds of tools? see a WebQuest activity before on the OSHA website or from an OSHA video. I like that. I like that a lot. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of this is relying upon the access to, you know, those channels, to those applications, you know, assuming a student, a learner can pull up that information or have access to that computing technology. I, you know, I get that fully. Um, a bubble chart on a Jamboard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like I like it. A bubble chart of possible OSHA actions. But even just um assembling, you know, what you know, kind of a flow. I mean, it, it the bullets are kind of listed in a flow, but maybe not, you know, out of order, kind of like employee must be at work at eight, employee came in, maybe a timeline, you know, with with designated, here's where the you know responsibility starts, here's where it ends, kind of a thing. Um setting, time, place, you know, some of those elements. I'm just vamping here now. So um, anyway, let me just wrap up and see if anyone has any questions about the information, a map, yeah. Any information, uh, questions rather, about the information that was shared today. Training to reevaluate the OSHA safety rules. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. I really enjoyed the discussion. So thanks everyone. Thank you all so much for your attendance today. I would just remind you and thank you so much, Laura, for uh, this great um, overview of the digital literacy framework learning modules. I think this will be a great tool um, for instructors and, and um, great to know uh, what we, uh, need to pass along to our students as we try to teach them the elements of the digital literacy framework. Excellent presentation. So again, you will receive a survey that will pop up when you log out of Zoom and your certificates of attendance will be coming to you um, sometime in the next few weeks so that you can show those to your programs if you're instructors. And again, we thank you and look forward to sharing with you the rest of the sessions of VTI. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, participants. Happy Valentine's Day.